Um, welcome everybody to another episode of the Remarkable Coach Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Michael Pacheco. Uh, today with me, I have once again an encore presentation of Honoré Quarter. Um, Honoré is a publishing strategist who has written more than 50 books, plus one since the last time we spoke. Uh, she helps aspiring authors to write, publish, and monetize their books, and she's fun. That's the bio that, that we've got. And I'm fun. Um, it's Honoré, debatable. It could so, be debatable. I don't think it can be. Okay, all right. I, Fair I disagree with that. Um, for those of our listeners and viewers who have not had the good fortune of listening to our first podcast together, first of all, for you guys, go back and listen to it. If they haven't done that, though, um, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself in your own words, who you are, what you do, why you do it. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure what I said last time, so this will be all new information. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> so I I am Honoré Quarter. I am an author of more than 50 books with uh, over four and a half million sold, which is one reason that um, I'm extra passionate about helping authors because I made a ton of mistakes. That number could probably be double or triple what it is if I knew then what I know now. So what I do is help people to walk through the stages of writing and publishing their book. And there are more than just those two stages. So they are crafting, writing, publishing, launching, marketing, and monetizing their book. So those are all independent stages that when someone understands how to navigate them, they can optimize and monetize their books most effectively, not just through selling books. So we speaking of topics that are debatable, I have many conversations on the regular with people who say, well, you don't make any money from book sales, right? You don't make, you don't make money selling books. I'm like, okay, well tell uncle Sam that because <laughs> <laughs> I've been paying taxes. <laughs> he's coming his hand. He's coming with his hand out all the time. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and it's like mid April right now. So we just went to that dance. Um, and then also they can monetize their book, which means they can turn their book into multiple income streams by producing other books, series, companion products, and mm -hmm. then other specific income streams that are built on the contents of their books, like courses, um, speaking, training, coaching, consulting, those sorts of things. And yeah. so um, my role, I believe on this planet, at least at this period in time is to help people successfully walk that path with as little pain and suffering and as much pleasure and profitability as possible. I love it. I really do. Um, why two, two part question, yeah. why isn't it as easy as write your book and publish your book? And how many books did it take you to learn that? Well, you can just write and publish your book. And there are a lot of people who provide that advice. Right. However, asterisk, see fine print below. If right. you really want your book to do in actuality what it is doing in your mind's eye, then there is some other care and concern that's oh. required in order for the book to, to do its job effectively. Mm-hmm. So you can just say, I'm just going to sit down and be the cat at the typewriter. Type, 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 type. Okay, upload Word document to Amazon, publish it. Voila, you are a published author. However, what then happens is the book does not do what you want it to do. Right. And I just spoke to a publishing industry professional today who shall remain nameless, but she is <laughs> a 600 pound gorilla in the space. Uh -huh. And she said to me, I'm embarrassed. I have a book for writers, but I'm embarrassed by it because when I wrote and published it, I rushed it. I went against my own advice and I oh. rushed the book. It has typos. The cover is bad. The information isn't bad, but I'm afraid someone's going to look at it and go, is this how she does this? Yeah. Because if this is how she does this, this is how she does everything right and so what people don't think about is and this is what i would love people to just stop for a second and consider what if you wrote and published a book that was still the milkshake bringing the boys to the yard in 10 years in 20 years uh 
<laughs> in 50 years. If you could have a book that was still working hard for you, i.e. making money, years and years and years and years. Yes, just like that one. Right? Just like that one. This yes. is still Napoleon relevant today. Hill, Napoleon Hill's grandchildren are like, yeah, that's my family. <laughs> <laughs> that was my grandpa. <laughs> Good job, Grandpa Hill. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you crushed it. Because there is now the Napoleon Hill Foundation Poor people don't have foundations. Yeah. Authors who just write and publish their book in a weekend don't make enough money to form foundations. Uh -huh. And so what I want people to do is just slow their roll a little bit and take some time to answer some quality questions before they put pen to paper, to carefully craft a book that has a job and fits into their business ecosystem that then goes out into the world and opens doors and creates connections that would never otherwise happen without that book. Mm -hmm. Nice. Are you, well, is your, 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 your friend, the 600 pound gorilla in the, in the industry, yeah. is she able yeah. to go back and write a, a second edition of the book and just basically, you know, sweep that old one under the, under the bed, so to speak? Yeah, of course. So here's the great news is being an indie published author, a self-published author means that as quickly as you published it, you can also unpublish it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, nothing to see here move along. She could also, and is, I think is planning to um, republish it, right? To kind of go through the manuscript, get some beautiful cover art, have yeah. a proper editorial process, uh, figure out what she wants the, the book to do, right? Because all the questions are, and maybe this is what we covered last time. It's like, what do you want the book to do? You know, the reader of the book to do. Like when uh -huh. someone reads your book, you want them to do something. I want yeah. people who read, you must write a book to write yeah. a book. Right. I want <laughs> them to not write a crappy book that doesn't fulfill their vision and doesn't do the job. Yeah. Right? So it's like, there's all these different questions. It's like, what do you want people to do? Well, I want them to hire me. What do I want them to not do? I want them to not hire me. I want them to write a book. I want them to not write a crappy book. I want right. them to, I want them to get to the pot on the, the other end of the rainbow. And the second part of your question was how many books did it take for me to figure that out? Two. The first one was a book that will never see the light of day. It was my freshman effort. Uh -huh. bad cover, no editing, didn't know what I didn't know. And I had a very direct, famous author look at the book and say, your book is good. Your, your writing is good, right? But this quality, the quality of this book, I don't know if this is a potty mouth podcast or not, but he used a workout word. He was like, yeah. no, no, no this, this is bad. He said, your book is shit. It's like yeah. your writing is good. Your book is shit. You have to do it again. And he introduced me to his graphic designer and uh -huh. he told me how to hire an editor. And so I did my first book the second time, sold uh -huh. 11,000 copies of the book and it changed my life. Yeah. And so now I sit here going, I have a high school education, no college, no writing class, successful career beyond anything that anyone saw coming, including me. Mm -hmm. And I want other people to have that. And I know that a book is a conduit to that when it's done really well. And so that's why that's why I do what I do is I wanna be the voice going, wait, make it professional, do the best <laughs> job you can do. Because the minute someone calls you and says, oh, your coaching program is $25,000 for three months. I'm in, I read your book, you're the coach for me, sold. You're gonna yeah. go, oh snap, this was a really good idea. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that, that makes, that makes a lot, a lot, a lot of sense. Um, you wrote, you wrote a book, a new one since the last time we spoke, which was not, not even what, six weeks ago, maybe, um, give or take a week. I don't know. Um, tell us about that. So I wrote a book called the Best Selling book, book formula, write a book that will make you a fortune. Uh, this book is exciting to me because two, for two reasons. One, when I say best-selling book, I actually mean best earning book. Anybody can be a best-selling author, right? You can publish a book on Amazon, like by eight o'clock tonight. 
And if you can get someone to go buy five copies, you'll be a best-selling author on Amazon. But that's not really what you meant, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? When you said, I want to be a best-selling author, what you mean is I want to be a best earning author. I want my book to make money week over week, month over month, year over year for a long time, right? Like thinking we're rich. Yeah. So we all want that. And in my partnership with Hal Elrod, everyone would come to me or a lot of people would come to me and they'd say, how can I be Hal? How can I do the miracle morning? And I would say, gosh, I'm sorry. Like Hal's a unicorn. He got hit by a lightning strike and, you know, he just got really lucky. He did a lot of podcast interviews, but like some people just are born under a lucky star. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute, <laughs> that's such a bummer. If that's really true. Uh-huh that's really true, then what's the point? Why would us poor schmucks not born under a lucky star? Not, you know, there's no rainbow over my head. Like what are, what are the chances that I'm going to be successful? And I started to question my assumptions and I went in search of evidence that perhaps best earning books were not lightning strikes at all, that uh -huh. there were, that there were things that had not been considered. And I identified four common keys and that's what the book is about. There are the four common elements of best earning books. Cool. And they are pretty quickly, they're easy to read, right? So they're at a grade level and a readability level that's easy for people to read and, and comprehend. Mm -hmm. They're easy to remember. So something about the book, like the best-selling book formula is easy to remember or the lifesavers or the miracle morning, even if someone remembers it wrong, the process that the author outlines is easy to do. So mm -hmm. the reader, can duplicate or exceed the results that the author has gotten by applying the methodology, the process, or the advice that's given in the book, which makes the book easy to share. So there's mm -hmm. four things, read, remember, do, and share. Because the number one way people learn about a book is through recommendation. Right. So if you say to me, Honoré, stop everything you're doing and read this book. This is the best book you're ever going to read in your whole life. I'm going to go, oh, big to be red pile. That's 2000 books. I'm going to just shove that to the side because Michael said, I need to read this book and I trust Michael. Yeah. And so once I discovered those, I was like, oh, this is amazing because people can bake in those four things into their book and exponentially increase the likelihood that their book is not just going to sell five copies to their grandmother it's going to sell millions of copies or hundreds of thousands of copies or certainly more than the average of the 250 to 500 that books actually sell in their lifetime, right? Even if a book only sells thousands of copies, but it leads people to your front door and you have services on the back end, you know, if you're a coach, if you're a consultant, whatever else, you know, if you're making money on the back end of a book, if the book is effective at starting conversations that lead to sales, I mean, that's also, right. that, that's nothing to sneeze at. Right. You must write a book. I sold 50,000 copies of you must write a book in the first six weeks after I wrote that book in 2016. I just did the fourth printing of that book, released that in February. Uh -huh. And that book is now responsible for all the things, right? So <laughs> just literally all of the things in the entire literally world. Literally all of the things that it, my life is it, as it stands, that the books in the series, two books in the series, soon to be three, two workbooks, soon to be three, a mastermind, courses, yeah. relationships, opportunities, this podcast, the lipstick I purchased to wear today, like all of it goes back to that original, to that book, which was born of the other books that I wrote. So I can uh -huh. trace back almost every magical thing in my entire life, including my husband, because my, my friend, connected us on a blind date and he saw my picture on the back of my book and he was like all right she's not hideous i can meet her <laughs> <laughs> she's got cute so, lipstick <laughs> she's got cute lipstick all right she's not terrible and she she has to be at least moderately smart because she has a book so yeah. i can trace back so many things to to the writing and publishing of a quality book yeah yeah i dig it i dig it um I'm going to take this in a, in a, in a completely different direction. I, this right. is something that I think it's, well, it's, it's a different direction, but it's something that's, it's a hot topic. It's a hot button topic lately. Uh, and I'm sure this is not the first time that you've been asked this question before, but where it, is, is there room in writing books for things like AI? So I think so. Um, I have, I'm avoiding it. 
because mm -hmm. I think there will be at some point, and we're signing things, signing things or agreeing to terms and conditions when we publish books that says I'm the owner of this copyright. Mm -hmm. And so I, I like to think I've used chat GPT one time to come up with a webinar title. Yeah. I didn't find it particularly helpful. I think AI is good and getting better all the time. I think there will be the people that are the, the people who feel like they need something like that to lean on. Mm -hmm. I'm a writer's writer, so I love writing and I want mm -hmm. to write. So I think there is going to be a big boon of people that are like, oh, I can write and publish a book in 30 minutes because I can ask chat GPT something or AI and boom, it's going to spit out something. But, but here's the other problem is AI created it and AI is going to narc on you. <laughs> because it's going to go, <laughs> you didn't write this. I wrote this. Uh -huh. And it's going to do some, it's going to do some plagiarism checks. Well, all of that is coming from somewhere. Uh huh. And so I'm avoiding it. I think a lot of people are freaking out and going, I'm not going to have a job and blah, blah, blah. It's like, look, nothing, nothing is replacing actual human con contact and thought process. Case in point, um, many authors are now getting locked out of their Amazon accounts because of AI, uh -huh. because it's flagging like you were naughty, we're locking you out of your account and they're having uh -huh. to escalate it until it gets to a human. And I had the same thing happen to me. They locked me out and they're like, oh, you, you, this is not good. You were naughty. And so uh -huh. I had to go, okay, but so not naughty. <laughs> Come back and <laughs> Right. Let's leave the story out of it. It was like, you were naughty. No, I wasn't naughty. No, I wasn't naughty. No, I wasn't naughty. Escalate, escalate, escalate. And finally a person looked at it and they were like, yeah, you're right. This is so obviously not naughty. Right. And then I'm reinstated, but a whole right. lot of activation in the meantime, it's that's only going to keep happening. I think, but uh -huh. also I'm not spending a ton of time thinking about it, Michael, because I'm too busy writing. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm writing. I'm writing. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah I think, um, I don't know. I mean, I think I think there's a place for it, especially in, you know, maybe more in like the, the fast food of, of book writing, like, like like social media content generation, stuff like that, maybe. Um, I, I can see I, I, I do see space for it to an extent. I, I was, it's interesting. I saw a video earlier uh, this morning. I stumbled across a video on YouTube where a guy this he's a YouTube creator and he does this, this YouTube stuff for a living and he used chat GPT to create a script for a video and he filmed so it's a two it's a two part video 10 minutes long give or take the first five minutes of the video is him going through the script and it's a tour of New York City and he goes through shot for shot word for word following the script from chat GPT and the second half of the video is his breakdown of that and how okay. it was far and away the worst video that he had ever made that it was completely soulless that it was disjointed it didn't make any sense it's like yeah. it's like technically it's there like you know they can say you know this person can say something, this person can say something, get a, you know, a, a drone shot coming right. into the Statue of Liberty, you know, things like that. Um, but in terms of, and this is where I see AI as being kind of limited is in terms of not only human creativity, but the human, cr the creative ability to take two disparate thoughts and connect them, right? Connecting dots. Yeah. is something I don't see AI being able to do yeah. super well because it's just, it's two things that are unrelated except for usually in some kind of abstract way. Right. A, a AI would not create um, a pina colada. Only humans would do that. <laughs> AI would never put pineapple on pizza. Right. And it would <laughs> never make um, a Reese's peanut butter cup because chocolate nope. and peanut butter would not bring those things together. So yeah. I, I think, I think it's, I think it's fun to listen to people freak out about it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I don't, I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Um, well, cool. What, uh, another question that I had for you that I wanted, I've been wanting to ask you're an author, you've written a ton of books. What books are on your bookshelf? Oh, all of them. <laughs> oh my gosh. All of them. So do you want to know the ones that are on my desk? Sure. 
Yeah. Okay. So I read this every day, The Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday. Love it. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to uh, Kent Sanders, who's in my mastermind. He know he knew that I read this like on my phone every day, and so he got me this beautiful leather bound copy. Um, I am a uh, feng shui master. I have my feng shui master certifications. I study feng shui, and I somebody sent me a copy of this book, Simple Shui for Every Day. So it's one little one little feng shui application every day. It's super fun. Huh. Um, I uh, I have a mutual friend uh, with Amy Porterfield, and so yep. he gave me a copy of Two Weeks Notice, which I read because my bestie is an engineer and she wants to become an entrepreneur. And so yep. I thought this was a might be a good book for her, and I read it, and I'm giving it to her next week. That's her brand new one, right? That just came out like a few weeks ago. Yep, yep, yeah. brand new. And then I'm a student of the Silva method. Jose Silva wrote mm -hmm. the Silva Mind Control Method, and so I got this book, Sales Power: The Silva Mind Method, which is really cool because it's one part like sales strategies and one part mental sales strategies. So that's fun. Um, those are just the ones like that are physical books on my desk. And then <laughs> I have this right here. This is my Kindle. This probably <laughs> has, oh, I don't know, 11 billion books yeah. on it. And then I have my iPad, which has my Apple uh, iBooks app on it, which has another 11 billion books. I think that's that's it within the arm's reach. 11 billion. I love it. 11 billion, which is the official that's the, that's, you know, that's done by the census bureau or something. Yeah, no, that, that, that tracks. I think that's a, that's a real number. Yeah. 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 Chat GPT didn't come up with that. No, <laughs> Honoré came. Yeah, Honoré made up a word. Only Honoré could make up the word, but I'm, I am all, but I'm reading on my Kindle. I'm reading a fiction and I'm reading a nonfiction. And then I have my, the, the stuff, the stack that I showed you is kind of my morning. So I start yeah. my morning with journaling and then reading yeah. the daily stoic and contemplating like, you know, the basic message of the, of the, of stoicism and the daily stoic is like, no matter what happens, stay calm. <laughs> huh? <laughs> it's all about how you react to situations. It is. It yeah. is. It doesn't matter. Like, don't get too, don't get too excited about anything. Don't get too big for your britches. Yeah. Stay calm, stay humble. It's going to be fine. And oh, if God. it isn't, you're going to die anyway. So who cares? <laughs> Incidentally, one of the books that, that I have on my desk is a fancy copy of Aurelius. Ooh. And this is a, uh, yeah, this is, this oh, is med nice. meditations. It is. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful print. It's an old one. Um, the pages are yellowing. It smells kind of funky. You know, I love it. I like old How books. many times have you read it and do you mark in it or not? I do not mark in, in this copy. No, I've, I've read, I've read meditations. I don't know, four or five times in the last four or five years, about once okay. a year. Um, I don't mark in this, in this copy, but I have at least two other copies of meditations. I was going to say like, there's the copy you save and then the copy right. you mark on, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got the, you know, what do they call it? Mass market paperbacks. I've got a couple of yeah. those somewhere. Only the nerds would have like the special edition that remains sacred. And then the other one where you're like highlighting and notes and the same thing with the think and grow rich. This is, this is my fancy copy. And I've also got the mass market paperback. Nice. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Course. Yes. <laughs> Nerd alert. Um, well, cool. What, what else is new? Is there anything else that's new that you want to chat about? I, I think I've kind of gone through most of my stuff. Well, I turned in my next manuscript to my editor. You've got another one. Monday. Yes. And this book, I'm also excited about it. It's called Write Your First Nonfiction Book. Okay. And it's actually a chapter by chapter. If you if you want to write a book and you're like, I'm too much in my head, like what goes in chapter one, what goes in chapter five? I broke that down. I took a couple of my books and I analyzed them. Like, what did I write in chapter one? What did I write about in chapter two? It's very meta because it's a book about how to write a book using my formula, using my formula to write the book to share my formula. Repeat that so last someone is really like, it's it's very meta. I I okay. I applied my formula for writing a book, uh -huh. explaining the formula about how to use the formula to write a book with the formula. That makes sense. Well, so that's what we were we were talking a little bit about that before we hit record. If if you're not eating your own cooking, then no one's coming to the restaurant. And you said you're 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 a, what did you say a player player coach? I'm a player coach. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. So this book I'm excited about because it's very much like you can write, you can write a book and the first chapter of any prescriptive nonfiction book is encouraging the reader. Like, Hey, yeah. you can do whatever I'm going to tell you, you can do. Yeah. So I wrote these eight chapters in uniform with my process uh -huh. and then giving people permission to say, so it'll come out in June, but giving people permission to say, but I don't want to encourage people in chapter one. I want to encourage them in chapter five. It's like, okay, move the chapter. Uh -huh. You are the author. You get to decide where everything goes. As long you, as it's you get to do that. Good. Yeah. You're the boss. Like I, people will say, you have to do this. And I'm like, I'm a grown woman. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> Try and make it. good luck. Good yeah. luck with that. Right. So it's the same thing with being an author. You get to decide where things go. But if you're really in your head about something, then like here, write the book according to this process. Yeah. And then it's like baking when you're when I was first learning to bake. It's like I follow exactly everything. And then after a while, I'm like, I want double the chocolate chips and I want to throw some coconut in there because why not? Yeah. It's my cookie. It's the same thing. That's classic. I mean, for any kind of art, I mean, that's kind of that's the the. You know, if you do an apprenticeship or a mentorship, they're they're always going to tell you learn the rules so you can then you can break them, right? Break them. Yeah, yeah. You learn to play Bach and then you play jazz. Right, right. So I wanted to I wanted to go next level. So I wrote you must write a book, which is you can you must write a book. You can write a book. This is why writing a book is a really good idea. But I didn't put in there any process. Yep. And so this is the, would be the companion to that. It's like, here is a process you can use to kind of get you off the dime, get you out of your head and into motion. I love it. I love it. So you've got your Amazon author page is ridiculous. Okay. You've got, <laughs> you've got 11 billion books. <laughs> Feels like it. Yeah. Um, where, where should we start? Someone coming in, they, they want to write a book. What, you know, one, if they, if they, if they had to pick th one to three books, let's say, um, to get them healthy, moving down the path, they're working on their own book. Where should they begin? Which, which book or two or three of yours should they start? I have that answer. I have that answer. So a professional wants to write a book, you must write a book and the, I must write my book workbook. So even if they get the digital copy, the ebook copy of You Must Write a Book, the fourth edition, go ahead and grab the physical copy of the workbook huh? because in there is timelines and resources and notes and things like that. Put all that in there. And then I don't have write your first nonfiction book yet. So maybe you're listening to this in July of 23, then that book is out. Grab that one. But in lieu of that, you're going to want the best selling book formula because it will help you to apply these easy keys that we were talking about a little bit ago to your book, which will then make it so that it's going to be more successful than it would be without those keys. I wish I'd had them. I wish I'd figured them out mm -hmm. much, much sooner. So those three, you must write a book. I must write my book and the best selling book formula or, and write your first nonfiction book. And nice. that's a, that's a good, like, write your book library. Yeah. And then if they wanted more, if I may, they can add in the publishing PhD course that I have, which is all of that on steroids with mm -hmm. all of the extra considerations and a little bit of me wrapped in if they want it, some live uh, access to me through Q and A's. And publishing so they, PhD is a course that they can get on your website? Yes, it's a blended learning course. So downloadables, awesome. videos, resources, all sorts of things. And so you can just get the course or you can get the course in the Q&As. And I do a live Q&A on Zoom 10 times a year with my students all over the world. And so they come and they bring their questions and I answer them like this and it's super fun. I love it. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. We'll get a, I'll make sure to put a link to that up on the show notes page. Um, Thank you. Who are your favorite fiction authors this okay is so, personal curiosity yeah so i'm a thriller reader okay i'm a thriller reader i love a good like grab me by the throat so my very very favorite thriller book of all time is behind closed doors by a woman named b.a paris b.a b.a 
I think her first name is like Beverly or something. She's British. She's delightful. I've listened to a couple of interviews. Nice. Um, but Behind Closed Doors is one of those books where you're like, oh, oh no, oh no, she didn't. <laughs> and then you just can't put it down. It's just one of those things. And then I've actually made friends. I have not made friends with B.A. Paris, obviously, or I would know her first name. Um, <laughs> but one of my other favorite thrillers is a book uh, called Swerve. And it is also another book that you're you better not have anything to do yeah because you can't put it down because <laughs> uh, you can't put it down and then more recently these are those are older books that i read and then more recently i saw all the hullabaloo, hullabaloo around colleen hoover who okay. at any one time has i don't know 97 of the top 100 books on the new york times list i'm exaggerating but she's a fiction writer who writes whatever she wants. She's wildly successful yeah. and publishers can't figure her out. She's traditionally published. She's indie published. She writes these crazy page turners. And there's one book of hers called Verity, V-E-R-T-Y, huh? V-E-R-I-T-Y, Verity. Verity is the name of the main character. And I saw about it. I waited, I don't know, six weeks to get it from the library. Yeah. Because I support my little small town local library. So I got on the thing and I and they're like, oh, it'll be eight weeks. You're 94 millionth in line for this book. I get the notification at like four o'clock. So I get in my car and I race down to the library. I'm home by five. I finish reading the book at nine. My husband was like, do you want to like, Mip. like, would you like some time? Mip. I need you <laughs> I to back. leave me alone. I took it back the next morning and they were like, what happened? And I was like, I'm done. I was like, I know somebody like me is waiting for it. It was so good. Super good. I also love just to be funny, and people are going to go, wait, what? Um, I also love Sydney Sheldon. Did you ever read any Sydney Sheldon? Not familiar. Stupid, ridiculous, gratuitous, masterful storyteller. Great books. Just really fun. Is are not going. It's not. It's probably going to kill a brain cell, but they're super fun stories. Yeah. He's a masterful writer. Weaves all the all the things together as a writer i appreciate the craft that when it that goes into those books yeah. i love james patterson uh -huh. i am more recently reading um john david mann wrote a series with bob berg called the go-giver uh -huh. and he has connected with brandon webb who is a navy seal and they are writing the steel series steel so steel fear so there's two of them and the next one comes out in July. So I just got an advanced copy of the third book. And that's, that's Bob Berg and John David Mann. Okay. And so then John David Mann uh -huh. partnered with Brandon Webb, who is a Navy okay. SEAL. Brandon yeah. Webb and John David Mann. Not yeah. Bob. So the go give the go giver and the go giver series. Those yep. are, uh, I'm familiar with those. What are they? They're not parodies. They are stories that are parables they're parables aphorisms parables parables is it yes. aphorism or parable it's a parable I don't know, but those are both ten dollar words so i don't know i mean i got 20 bucks <laughs> okay <laughs> i can buy all the ten dollar words i want nice um, <laughs> yes so um so i think those are um jt ellison is a thriller writer that lives here in nashville and i'm reading all of her stuff it's like, I just need more time to read. Yeah. Do you read pretty fast? Yeah, I read, I read probably three nonfiction and two to three, not uh, three, two to three fiction a week. Wow. That's yeah. very fast. I love to read. It's my favorite thing ever since I was a very little boy. Um, you know, I was reading the Lord of the Rings series when I was like seven years old, eight years old. Um, mm -hmm. But my Achilles heel is that I read incredibly slowly. I, I sub vocalize everything. So I just, I read very slowly. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Have you ever taken a speed reading class? Two, two times. Two times. And I can't, no, I can't, no I can't get past, especially with fiction. I can't get past the sub vocalizing because I like to play out the scene in my head. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. No, I just, I, I read it's my job. So I yeah. read very fast. It's annoying to my husband because he'll, I'll sit down and read a book and 
Yeah, He's my has dyslexia, so it's not easy for him. So that's me too. Yeah, I've also got a little bit. I struggle with that a little bit too, and then yeah, my, love it as much as I do. My wife and I will sit down, and and if we're even looking at something, you know, on a web page or something, she'll if she's got the mouse, she'll be scrolling, and I'll be like, slow down. I slow can't. Down. Yeah, I'm not keeping up with you. I'm not. Yeah. There's no way I'm keeping up that fast. Anyways, I digress. Um, Awesome. Andre, is there anything else that you'd like to chat about that we haven't touched upon yet? We haven't talked about your book and the possibility that you're going to write a book someday. So it's going to happen. You um, wanted me to open the door live on the air. <laughs> you're going to cut this part out, out of the, of the conversation. But go. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've always, you know, I, I have a, a, an, an undergrad in Japanese literature. Um, and like I said, I, oh yeah. It's, it's a weird, well, I had Japanese language and literature, so I've got weird specializations. I wanted to be a translator. Ohio gozaimasu. Ohio gozaimasu. <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to be a translator for a time, and I did commercial translation for a little while, and it was awful. Um, oh. And literary translation, well, commercial translation, I was doing things like tourist brochures. So it's just not, there was oh, nothing, yeah. there was no passion I there. I about that. Okay. Yeah, there was no passion. There it was not fun. I wanted to do literary translation, but it um, it was just, it's such a mammoth mountain to climb. And I lost, um, I just lost interest in it about, you know, halfway, three quarters of the way th through and ended up moving back to the United States, which blew a lot of the wind out of the sails. When I was li living in Japan, you, just, you have to know, you know, you have to understand idioms. You have to yeah. understand stuff like, you know, cultural idiosyncrasies, things like that. I've been and, studying French for years. I have a French tutor. I meet with him every Thursday mm -hmm. morning and to learn the French language, but all the time, like that's how I know someone is the right person to teach me uh -huh. is that they can say, oh, well, we're going to kill two birds with one stone. Well, if you say that to someone in a foreign language, they're like, why are we killing birds? What are we doing? Right. <laughs> right. But we understand that as yeah. native English speakers. So yes, there's a whole, there's the, hi, how are you, right? Direct language. And then there's all the other stuff that makes it colorful and interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and If you're not living in it, it is probably very hard to sustain that and to continue to progress. Yes. Certainly. Yeah. And, and especially if you're, you know, if you're do, translating something like modern literature, you know, something that was written six months ago and they want to publish it in, you know, Western culture in English, you have to understand everything that's going on in that culture that's, you know, in the book. Um, so anyways, um, I've always Next level smart right there. I've always wanted to write a book. I'm just, I'm not sure yet, uh, what, what that looks like. I don't know what the, t the subject or the topic would be. Mm. Well, so. that's maybe cause for a conversation another day. But generally speaking, when someone asks me what they could write a book about, it's what are people coming to you for already yeah. that you do in your business sure. that it would make sense to position you as the expert. So you already sure. know the subject. Yeah. You already are answering. You're already fielding the questions. You're also recognizing that people are not asking. Uh, and I did, I just did a, an eight, I did a, a, a challenge for my newsletter list, mm -hmm. the eight day, write your book challenge. And I talk about level one, two, and three questions because mm -hmm. level one questions are the things that I know to ask you, like, you know, how do you, you know, how do you start to learn a, la a foreign language? How did you start to learn Japanese? Mm -hmm. But then there are the level two questions and the level three questions that as experts, we are not being asked because the person doesn't know to ask them because they don't have our breadth of knowledge. Right. The things that you don't know that you don't know. Correct. So yeah. there's the, there's the logical questions that almost anybody would ask. Then there are the next level questions, which people may know to ask you, but probably they don't. Yeah. And then there are the level three questions. It's like, you don't know what you don't know. And that's the, that's the inside baseball stuff, right? That's the, that's the money. Interesting. And so those are the, those are the things that start to help you to outline a book. And then you figure out what's the job of the book. So back to the beginning of our conversation, it's like, what's the job? The job is to bring business to you. Yeah. And so how do you help someone in the context of your book while establishing yourself as the expert so that when they need what it is you sell, 
Mm -hmm. Your book is the book that eliminates the question, is this the person that I need to hire? Because I like the personality. I like the information. Clearly the expert. Mm -hmm. This is someone that I could engage with. So the book's job is to have all of that stuff wrapped into it. But that's where I, I yeah. suggest that you start. It's like, what would you, what was, what's the information that you would need to convey to someone so that they would say, here's my American Express card. Mm -hmm. <laughs> here's my MX. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I got I'll give that some thought. I'll give that some thought. Excellent. Yeah. Maybe I'll sign up for your mailing list. <laughs> Oh, oh. I'll send you the challenge. I'll send you the challenge. <laughs> um, sweet. Well, Honoré, thank you so much for making time to chat with me again. It's been a pleasure, always. as always. Yeah, let's do it again. I get your emails. I always check and see, like, who's who's, who's been new? in the chair and who's sharing stuff and what are you talking yeah. about? Love it. Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Always a pleasure. Thank you to our viewers and listeners. Always a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, thanks, everybody. We'll and see we'll you see next. you guys next time. Take care.